And we're live and welcome to Expedition Church of the Triad uh, here in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. We are a suburb of Greensboro, 4.5 miles from Interstate 85 at the Elm Eugene exit. Love to have you come be with us. Praise the Lord. You can find us on the internet at expeditiontriad.org. Hallelujah. Or on Facebook at Expedition Triad. Hallelujah. Look forward to having you uh, join us online and come see us in person. Praise the Lord. All right, so the um, last two weeks we've been out. One, well, actually, one week we didn't have church because it was July 4th. We just, we just didn't do that Wednesday night. week before, um, I, we were out visiting family from, you know, being out gone for the summer. I mean, out of school all year and had, had that time to go visit, take care of some stuff. So we were gone. And um, we, the week before that, everybody said the week before that, Okay, we started on reclaiming the blessing through words, and in that uh, service, we, we took a, a rabbit trail and never come, came back. <laughs> we, were, we were just, I mean, we were like a beagle chasing a rabbit. We were gone. <laughs> uh, my, my son said one time he was out hunting, I had taken him over to near Raleigh somewhere on some game land, and uh, some guys had told him that uh, there was a, a tree stand out there. He is living, anybody could use it. So he's up there, and he, he heard the beagles coming. Because down the east, they, they, they let beagles track them, hunt them. And then they, you know, and they, 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 could hunt, they actually can hunt from the ground. They don't have to be up in the stand. And he heard, he heard them coming. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I mean, a ton of them. He said they got to the tree stand, and they stopped, tails wagging, and looked up at him and just wagged their tail, barking and howling, and then took off again. <laughs> it's people. Hallelujah. And then went right back to hunting. <laughs> they ran that deer about two miles or more. I kept running it, and, but I think it got away. Because the beagles probably picked up some other scent and got carried away. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, we talked about that, and we, so we got off on that trail, and, and it was good. It was a good service, and we, you, know, you can go back and listen to it if you missed it. Um, but we, well, let's go back, and we're going to pick back up in here and, get, and segue back into it and then go forward. Um, so let's just start with our main narrative here. Uh, each day that we have an we each day we have the opportunity to choose whether or not we will live in a way that is pleasing to God. <clears throat> we activate or deactivate the blessing in our lives. Make sure you get, you you need to really understand this by the words we speak. Okay, now this is not the power of positive thinking. This is not the power of you know positive thinking. This is the reality of the power of God's words, okay? They have authority, okay? Um, Jesus died so that we can receive the blessing and not the curse. We must understand the Abrahamic covenant in order to understand uh, how to have confidence in the blessing of God. Let's go, if we will, to Galatians chapter 3. And I believe we probably, we got, I'm not even sure if we got there the other, other week. We, uh, I mean, we jumped out pretty early on a different trail. Hallelujah. And we did because I, I remember quoting J.B. Phillips for Galatians 3.1. Um, Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. Again, J.B. Phillips says, O ye dear idiots of Galatia. I just like that. I mean, it's just like, I can quote Bible and call people idiots. All right. The, uh, this only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Having, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye, therefore, that they which are of faith the same are the children of of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed 
with faithful Abraham, or as the margin says, with believing Abraham. Okay? For as many are as under the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that containeth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, just kind of de, de King Jimmy that. That means that if you're trying to live by the law and you miss one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. So, if you got out Sunday and drove to a restaurant, you're guilty of the whole law because you went too far. You could only go, uh, uh, I don't know how, I remember how far. It was like less than a mile walking on the Sabbath. When, so, really, on Saturday, not even, not even Sunday, because Sunday's not the Sabbath in the Bible. Saturday is, okay? Saturday's the biblical Sabbath. And so, um, if you drove and you traveled, from your house down here on uh, Walter Wright Road up here to Times Square Pizza, according to the law, you sinned. Well, not only did you sin, you broke the whole law. You know, you were guilty, just as guilty as the thou shalt not kill guy. All right? So he says, um, for as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse so there's a curse. Amen? Now, we know Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14, is the, um, the blessing of the law. Amen? And then 15 through 61 is the curse of the law. You know, and it starts out, blessed art thou in the city, and blessed art thou in the field. Blessed when you come in, blessed when you go out, blessed when you rise up, blessed when you lie down. Everything you set your hand to, blessed. Every place your foot shall tread. I've given, I mean, he just goes on and on and on and on. And then he starts out. But if you have failed to obey what I tell you to do, you are cursed. You're cursed when you come in. You're cursed when you lie down. And we got three times as many of those as we do the blessings. I mean, they just, you know, as a matter of fact, I mean, I think we get in there talking about M-Rods and all that kind of stuff. None of that sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm not sure. I think I looked it up one time to see what M-Rods were, but I wasn't interested in having it in the first place. So I really wasn't going to feed on it. All right. <clears throat> um, so he says, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book. No man, is, no man that is justified by the law in the sight of God, for it is evident the just shall live by faith. Okay? We are to live by faith. Okay? This is how we're supposed to live. By faith. Now, we are not to live by human reasonings. Now, listen. Understand that God gave us a brain to use it. To, uh, I mean, it, you do, we do use our gray matter, but I don't live by my gray matter. I live by faith. Okay, I walk by faith. I don't walk by sight. There are things that your brain will tell you you shouldn't do, like walk out in front of a car. Okay? Don't walk out in front of a car. Why? You'll get hit, especially if you don't give them time to stop. Your brain will tell you that, all right? But... Living by faith means that we're, we look at things that are impossible to achieve or impossible to do or impossible in the natural to accomplish, and we are able to do them because we're believing God because God told us to do it or the Word of God tells us to do it. Okay. So we're not denying the reality of using cognitive skills, but they don't supplant faith. Okay? And it's great when they line up together. But when they don't stay in agreement, brains, sense, and faith, you got to go with faith. All right. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Let's stop there before we move on. Notice that we're not redeemed from the blessing. We're redeemed from the curse. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay, so curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. What? That the blessing of Abraham, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let's get the rest of it. 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
So the promise that God made to Abraham is available to us how? Through faith. All right? Brethren, I speak after the man, manner of men. So Paul's going to give you an example here. That's, let me say, for example, in the natural, that's what he just said, I speak after the manner of men. In the natural, men, hallelujah, have covenants. So said, though, it be, though it be but a man's covenant, so men and women enter into covenant or contractual relationships, okay, business-wise, uh, rest, I mean, owning things, property, et cetera, et cetera. Marriage is a covenant, okay? Now, no, so he says they do that. And look, yet if it's confirmed, so in other words, let's say we, we're going to make a, a contract. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm selling Jerry my car. We go down and get the agreement notarized. Agreement signed in front of a notary. They notarize it. Now what's happened? It's confirmed. If I did for some reason, like I told, I sell the car to Jerry. Let me go. Let me make it more personal. Went in one time to get um, buy a car for Crown. You know, I think Crown's no longer. I don't even think they're even here anymore. Um, you know, it's Greensboro Dodge and stuff. Went in Crown to get a car. And we had gotten a little bit burned by them on another car earlier in our life. And, um, you know, I, I forgot what it was. Something we wanted, and they gave it to us, but it wasn't a Mopar part. It was a third-party part. It wasn't what I wanted. I wanted Mopar. There you go. So we went to buy the, the Jeep we have now. And it didn't have mass. It was a program car. Only had 8,900 miles on it. You know, I guess the, you know, the president or whoever runs the dealership was driving it around. He put 8,900 miles on it and no floor mats in it. <clears throat> and we're almost done this deal after she tried to about four, two hours to get us to buy a four-cylinder. And I said, we are not buying a four-cylinder. Read my lips. Potential spam. All right. <laughs> we are not, we want a six cylinder. Yeah, this one's just, yeah, nope. She, she convinced us to take it out for a test drive. Went to go get on the interstate, and I felt like Fred Flintstone. <laughs> I mean, you know, the engine's going, me. <laughs> so I took it back, and said, I told you, the six cylinder. No, not buying the four-cylinder. It had all the cool gadgets. I, I, it had a sunroof. I mean, it had all kinds. Of, but the engine, that sunroof ain't going to get me up the mountain. Hello. And so we're, sign, we're signing all the paperwork to buy the six-cylinder. And, and it was cheaper, I mean, obviously, than the, because it was a program that wasn't brand new. Um, and uh, we said we want not four minutes. Okay, okay. They'll just give you the, okay. Four minutes. And um, I finally got, I said, I, I need you to put that in writing. And uh, I said, now, Mopar, Cherokee floor mats. You know the ones that say Cherokee or Jeep? That's what I want. We get to the back, the guy's doing the paper, I mean, right, running everything else so we can sign it. I said, what does it say about the, his floor mats? I said, no. I said, Mopar Cherokee floor mats. Okay, that's fine. We'll do it. No, no, no. I want it in writing. No, I'm not signing that. He said, you mean you'll, you'll walk? I said, I will walk away from this right now if you don't put that on there. So he gets up and goes back out there. Takes about 10 minutes. Well, how long does it take for the person to put Cherokee Mopar floor mats? You know, to go with this vehicle. Because they were $160. They didn't want to pay the $160 to get the part in there. And he comes back. I said, let me see it. <laughs> I said, okay, well, now sign the papers. 
<clears throat> once that was all done and notarized, it was confirmed. They can't take away from it. And they can't, they, they're not going to add to it, but they can't add to it. I can't add to it. Okay, in other words, he can't take something away and not give it to me. And I can't add something to it and say, you didn't give me this. Okay? We didn't put it in writing. So I learned my lesson. I don't, they can, they'll be your best friend. You know, we're your friends. We're your friends. We're your friends to the bitter end. Jungle Book. Okay. Have you ever heard, jungle, saw Jungle Book? The cartoon Jungle Book? Yeah. You know, the, the, the buzzards. We're your friends. They look like the Beatles. Yeah, they look like the Beatles. <laughs> Dick, did you ever see it? Yeah, okay, yeah. All right. So here he's saying that when there's man makes a contract, when it's confirmed, when it's sealed, whatever, it cannot be uh, disannulled or added to. So God has made a covenant. <coughs> blood was shed with Abraham. Hello. What was the blood? Circumcision. Okay. Blood was shed to confirm that covenant. Now, you can't add to it or take away from it. God can't take away from it. Y'all hear? It's sealed in blood. It's ratified. It's sealed. It's confirmed. <clears throat> now, I know man will go to court and try to use some kind of slick loophole method or whatever and get out of stuff all the time. But in reality, you're not supposed to be able to do that. That's, that's just because man can be dirty, rotten, low down, no good bums at times when it comes to money. More often than not. <clears throat> so, he, he makes this statement. Paul gives this idea. Men make covenants that can't be added to or, or uh, disannulled. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now he goes on and says this. And he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So now he's saying, the example that you can understand is that when men make covenants and it's confirmed, you can't add to or take away from it. It's sealed. You know, I, I've had people tell me things like, well, you know, God's sovereign and he can do what he wants to do. And so he can just say no. Paul said he can't. That's what he just said right there. Using that, use an carnal or natural example to make the point to them that you just can't say no to a covenant that's made. You don't have the right. And remember, Satan is what? The father of what? He's the father of lies or liars. And all liars have their part in the lake of fire. Now, we try to be cute and call lying sovereignty. Sovereignty. If God promises an oath to do something and it's ratified, it's sealed in blood, and then when you meet the conditions of the covenant promise, and he goes, well, I'm just not going to do it. He lied. What would that make? God. Subordinate to Satan because he'd be a liar. God can't do it. Well, we call it, we, no, he's sovereignty. No. His sovereignty, listen to me now, was involved when he chose to make the covenant. Knowing full well all the ramifications of making that promise with every intent to keep that promise. He can't come back at a later date because no man can add to or disannul. That's the example. God can't disannul what he promised. This has been ratified. Well, how has it been ratified? Now it's been ratified in the blood of Jesus. This new covenant established upon new promises, new and better promises, sealed in the blood of Jesus. 
And when that was sealed, God's promise was ratified. So he doesn't get the right, the opportunity, and then theologically, and it's, it's, it, it, the sovereignist doctrine is off in that arena. Okay? So I had, I had a friend tell me one time, he says, well, you know, um, you know God, God loves his children, and he could just decide not to do it because he loves his children. No, 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 no. Now, I know the vast majority of promises are conditional. And that's stated in the whole thing. If, you know, even Deuteronomy, if you, keep my if you keep my covenant or keep my promises or keep my word, keep my commandments, that's what it is, keep my commandments, then I will. Okay? So, now, it's not an out for God, but if you're not keeping the covenant or keeping his commandments, then you don't qualify for the promise. We're under grace. We get it. No, it don't work that way. That's not how it worked. Let me say something. These people who believe that you don't have to obey God, it's just going to happen, haven't studied their Bible. They've studied a narrative, and they've cherry-picked to get a narrative, but they haven't studied the whole. What do you mean? God proved Abraham in obedience by commanding him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Well, I don't have to. I had some woman, oh, 10 years ago, maybe longer, probably longer, because that's when I wrote my, uh, I did my series on grace, what it is and what it isn't. Some of y'all remember that series on grace, what it is and what it isn't. Okay. Number one, it's not a license to sin. Like some people, old preachers used to say, uh, if we, we find out people sin without a license. <laughs> you don't have to have one. <coughs> oh, yeah, we, uh, even church folk. But that, this woman got into a discussion on Facebook, you know, in a thread. I don't do that anymore. I just get, I ain't wasting my time. Let the dumb be dumb still. I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll share what I want to share. And if you want to argue about it, go ahead. Go, go, just go, go, go. Listen. I will call to see if I can get you on Oprah with Dr. Phil, and y'all can have it out. Okay? Um, and so she's going, um, I'm under grace. I don't have to give. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to obey. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to do this, and I don't. I'm like, okay, let me just take them one by one. The head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, said, Give. And it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall be given to your bosom. I don't have to um, tithe. Hebrews, he received, there, talking about heaven, he, Jesus, the high priest, receiveth them. All right? I don't have to obey. Obey those with the rule over you. Okay? I, mean, I, was, just going through this, I was just going through this thing, you know? And I'm like, well, I got scripture for everything you said you don't have to do. I got scripture, New Testament scripture that says, do it. I don't have to go to church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. You know, okay, we don't believe in, we don't believe in pastors. We have house church. Wherefore, when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. What for? For the King James says perfecting, for the maturing of the saints. Well, you don't believe in pastors? Jesus does. As a matter of fact, he sent the gift of pastor and all the other five gifts there to the church to help them grow. We just get together at house church like they did in the book of Acts. You know, Paul wrote what he wrote during the book of Acts period. Now, it's not like the first church out the door. You know, it grew. Obviously, if everybody got saved at one time and you got all new baby Christians, somebody is not going to be ready to be pastor yet. They grow into it. Okay? The gifts are developed. All right? So they would, have, they would actually take the elders, the older people, and have them just because they were older and smarter than the dumb young ones. And we've all been young and dumb. I have been. There are days my wife thinks I still am. 
Oh, come on, that's a joke, guys. Come on. I, I still think about doing some young and dumb things. You know, I don't beat my head on the wall anymore. I stopped doing that. It does hurt. I never let anybody know. Yeah, cause, because I got the result I was looking for. They didn't mess with me. You don't mess with crazy. That's rule number one. Don't mess with crazy. Okay? So, let's, let's move on from here. So, here we got God cannot break the covenant. Everybody with me? God cannot break the covenant. And you cannot throw sovereignty out there as an excuse for God to lie about not breaking the covenant. It doesn't fit. All right. And to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God and Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul it. That it should make, it of none of, make the promise of none effect. <coughs> For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore serveth then serveth the law? It was added because of the transgressions. Till the sea should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained of angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not one, uh, is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which we could obtain life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be to, given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there, now listen, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Stop. See, because it's spiritual. Your status in the natural means doodly squat. It doesn't matter, matter, does not matter what hierarchy you're under. Doesn't matter which country you're living in, to as to which race has the uh, higher caste in the caste system. Hello, are y'all here? It doesn't matter if you have a female-dominated society, a male-dominated society, a you know. Oh gosh, let me think. Well, actually, the Bible recognizes three races: the Jew, the Gentile, and the Church of God. Okay, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew. It doesn't matter if you are a Gentile. It doesn't matter, you know, there is no um, hierarchy in God. If you are born again, you're a child of God. Okay? That other stuff is man-made. All right? And, of course, now you're hearing, you're hearing all kinds of terms that, that just nauseate you, you know. The white heterosexualization of society and all that. You know, a gagamagot. Okay, so he says we're all one in Christ Jesus. So listen to me. Now, I know sometimes we use these terms and trying to identify cultural differences in how uh, people relate to God or worship God. You know, the black church or the white church. I got news for you. There's a church. And it doesn't matter if everybody that gets together in that building that Sunday are all a black if they're all white, if they're all Asian, if they're all Latino, it does all Islanders. It doesn't matter. You know, you could call it a black church, an Islander church, a white church, a you know Asian church. You can call it all that, but it's a church. They are part of the body of Christ. And let me tell you something: when you get to heaven, Jesus ain't going to go say uh, the white church is over here, the black church is over there, the Latino church. That's not going to happen. I said that's not going to happen. We're not going to be divided by uh, ethnos. We're not going to be by our ethnicity. We're not going to be divided. 
Y'all here? You gone home? Um, so the law of 430 years cannot disannul, make it in effect. For if the inheritance be the law, it's no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Then I, 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 I'm trying to pick up where I left, left off. Okay. In the, in the, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, uh, that which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been a law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Doesn't matter what color you are. There's not a white gospel. There's not a black gospel. There's, not a, there's a gospel. There wasn't a Jewish gospel and there wasn't a Gentile gospel. There was a gospel. All I'm hearing is crickets. Okay. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up into faith, which should actually be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, that we might be justified by faith. Verse 25. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, where as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, Greek or G Greek or Gentile. Greek, Greek or Gentile is referring to the same thing in the New Testament. Okay? There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Now, and if you be Christ, possessive, apostrophe S, if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. Verse 16, you look back across there. Mine is right next to it in the Bible. One's on one page, one's on the right beside. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Okay? Now, what we have here is a covenant promise made by God to his friend Abraham that was ratified in blood, and it was to him and his seed. Now, so often, we want to go say, well, that was to the Jews. That was to Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, and the, you know, the 12 tribes, and to that seed, that natural lineage. Now, there is a side that works there, but it's not what he, he was referring to, and Paul makes it very clear here. It was to the seed that was coming through that lineage, Christ. Christ and he says here, and to that seed, which is Christ. And so now we have this covenant promise between God and Abraham that was going to be given to Christ. That's, that was the end of the promise was Christ. But then Paul goes on in the same chapter and says, <clears throat> and if you, be, if, if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you are in Christ, you're the seed. Because we become identified in him. We are his body. We are therefore in a position and have the right to receive the promise. Well, what was the promise? In blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thee. Okay? Uh, Wayman says, uh, I will bless you and bless you and increase you and increase you. So it is a blessing of good, of mercy, of being the friend of God. And it just goes on. It's a, it's a huge blessing. I mean, it's enough to make you Pentecostal. I mean, if that don't make you a tongue talker, nothing will. Hello. Okay? And so in this chapter, we find out that part of the redemptive work of Christ was to break, because the law had been given because of the disobedience of man, the law had been given because of the rebellion of man, and he was, and he, he needed to constrain them, and so he had to constrain them naturally with the law. So that he could get the prom he could get the seed here to make the promise with, so that the promise, that the, the seed could then bring people into the body of Christ, the body of the seed, and be heirs to the promise. It was a plan of God that was outsmarted the devil, which ain't that hard to do for God. Okay? 
Jesus, so he says there, he says um, that Jesus died on the cross. He took the curse. He became the curse, took the curse that the blessing of Abraham might, blessing of the spirit might come on the Gentiles through faith. <clears throat> he opened up all people to be candidates through believing through the new birth to receive the promise and blessing of Abraham. Now, I, I, you know, you, you re Facebook people will just make your head spin. I look out there and, and, and listen to people, and I'm thinking, oh, my Lord. An elementary student with a Bible knows better than that. I mean, you know, but they got their, they've got their doctrine. They've got, they got their revelation. They're all trying out for Ka and the next live action Jungle Book. So they can spin their eyes and go, trust in me, trust in me. Woo, woo, woo. And Bogley's going. And people get on Facebook. Have y'all seen that? Yeah, I know y'all saw this commercial. It's, it's old. Got this tall, overweight, slobby-looking guy with a camera coming down the sidewalk, and he sees one of his friends as a girl, and she says, um, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm meeting a, a, a girl from Paris today. And um, she asked him, how did he do? It was on Facebook. It was on, it was on the Internet. And this girl comes walk up. He goes, bonjour. You, know, you remember that commercial? He was a, okay, so a guy walked up. Okay, I got it. Okay. Oh, that's right. She was talking to a friend. The guy walks up. And he goes, bonjour. And she's, oh, he's from the internet. He's, a, he's Parisian. I don't care where he's from. If I was a girl, I wouldn't have dated him. Dear Lord. I mean, you look over the dictionary and saw the word ugly. That was his picture. Yeah. You know, don't, don't get your doctor from off Facebook. I remember radio days. When I first got saved, I was in Greenville, North Carolina. That's where we're from, down that area. Brother Bill was on the radio. He, he sandwiched himself in between Copeland and Hagen. But there was a, a, a pastor of non-Pentecostal persuasion that he had scripture wars with each week. Brother Bill would teach the week on the Christian radio station. The next week, that guy would come back and you know, try to combat everything he taught. Brother Bill got to listen to his program for a week. Came back the next week and undid everything he undid. And they were both very convincing. Bill was better. I didn't know him then. Yeah. I remember the first time I'm, I was in church, I, mean, I was out of town when we first came, first service. And I came back next week and, and he said, uh, I'm Bill Bailey. I went, Are you on the radio? <laughs> Yes, amen. <laughs> <coughs> Hallelujah. I listened to you on WBZQ. Down in Greenville. All right. Christ delivered us from the curse of the law. See, God, the, the, that, that curse of the law and the law added 430 years after the promise could not disannul the covenant. Gun sensible, gun control laws, 230, 40, 50 years later, let's see, three years would be 250 years. I know this because I was the bicentennial class. We were the two, class of 76. We were 200 years as a nation. That was, we, that was our right to passage. We were the bicentennial class. All right? In three years, it'll be 250 years. There's a, there's a second amendment immediately added at, at the time they, 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 Confirmed the Constitution. They put in the Ten Amendments. Okay? They're constitutional guarantees. You cannot come. Listen, this is the argument that has to, it keeps going on. There is no right, hello, to infringe upon the people to carry, keep in Washington, D.C., and out in the, on the, uh, the coast that needs a lot of help. Okay, all these laws they're making the big cities and the big, big you know anti-American cities 
cannot disannul which is ratified and sealed. So they put penalties on you. You know, like this guy in New Jersey got seven years because he was moving from one apartment to another and he put his uh, firearm in the back of the car and not loaded, but he had, um, oh gosh, not, I mean, uh, bullets. I think there's another word for, what do you call bullets besides bullets? Ammunition. ammunition, yeah. His ammunition was in the back with it. They gave him seven years. Well, you, you, know, you violated the Second Amendment because I have the right to keep and to bear arms. And you can't disannul my right to do that because you got nut bags in there. They want to take all the guns away. So they try to you know, make it so hard you, to get them or have them by making laws that, that basically, in effect, disannul the covenant or the Constitution. But God, when he, when he added the law, when the law was added, it was added to keep them in line with the promise. Wasn't to take the promise away. It did not take away the right, hello, to be blessed coming in and blessed going out. But in that, you know, in, in all of that, are you here? When God said he's going to bless them, and all nations be blessed to him, <coughs> so the law was added later, and it was a curse. Well, Christ came and took the curse away. This is no longer valid because it never undid the original in the first place. It was still valid all along. Hello? You know, they still had a right to be healed before Jesus came. They had a right to be healed before the, before the law. They had a right to be healed during the law. They had a right to be healed after the law. Hello? God, used, God gave them a compound covenant name, the very first one he ever used. Amen? Deuteronomy 28, down there he goes this way. And, um, you, you know, uh, he did something, he goes, says this, For I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's Jehovah Rapha in the Hebrew. And that's the first time that God took the name Jehovah and added an other aspect to that beyond the covenant God, because Jehovah, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. -H. I'm not even going to try to say what it is. The tetragram? A tetragrammaton. The four letters, Y-H-W-H, -H, which we get Yahweh or Jehovah from, depending on what linguistic background you use is a tetragrammaton. We're going to put that up there. It is a tetragrammaton, Pastor. So I have it up here all the time. You, know, you won't see it, but I'll see it every time. Oh, there it is. It's a tetragrammaton. You don't have to say anything. Just put tetragrammaton up there. I will know what it means. <coughs> don't put it on the bottom of the screen. You'll have people sitting in church going, what language is that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, was, the con was the covenant name of God. Now, we've translated Jehovah, and other, other schools of linguistics have translated it or, or added to it. It's not, it's not translated. You can't, you can't speak it. It's Y-H-W-H. -H. It's four-letter tetragrammaton. Did I get it right? Hey! All right. I don't know if I get it right next service, but I got it right then. All right. It's the covenant name of God. Now, of all the things that God could have done and give, and used a compound, and all the compound covenant names, uh, uh, Schofield says that the covenant names, uh, the compound covenant names of God are ever-increasing self-revelation of who he is. So when he said, I'm the covenant-keeping God, Jehovah, Every time you see the word Lord in the Old Testament with the little capitals, they're all capitals, but the little. That is Jehovah or Yahweh. It's, it's, it's the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. Okay? It's Jehovah. All right, we'll just say Jehovah. And um, every time you see that, it means the covenant God, the God who keeps covenant. Then when you get, the, like, I am the Lord that healeth thee, it is Jehovah hyphen Rapha, R-A-P-H-A. It means I am the Lord, thy physician, the Lord that healeth thee. So God says, I'm the covenant God. So he's tying 
being the healer to the covenant. Hello? I am the covenant God that heals you. So God's saying part of that covenant is you get me, and here's another revelation of who I am. So he's not adding to the covenant. It's already there. He's just revealing who he is. I'm the God that heals you. Hey, glory to God. I mean, he says, I am, in another place, I am Jehovah Shalom. I am the Lord, your peace. Amen. I am Jehovah to sit the Lord, your righteousness, the covenant God, who is your righteousness. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that makes provision for you. I'm the covenant God who makes provision for you. Okay. I'm Jehovah Shammah. I'm the covenant God who is ever present, who is there. He used these different names throughout the Old Covenant, Old Testament. Okay? They're all tied to the covenant. Jesus came and took this law and said, okay, this isn't in original intent. So I'm going to take the curse of this whole thing, all the curse, everything that keeps man out of walking in this covenant, and I'm taking it to the cross. Amen. So I'm going to take the sin. I'm going to take the curse. I'm going to take all this stuff that interferes with you being able to receive the blessing that stands in the way. And so I'm going to become a curse for you. And in doing so, now the blessing of Abraham can come on you through faith in me. He sets it all up. Hallelujah. And he sets it up in a spiritually legal system. God has made a legal, in the realm of the Spirit, in the realm of the Spirit where He is supreme, He is the supreme court. The executive branch and the judicial branch all rolled up into one. It is a theocracy. But He's just. He's merciful. Amen? And he's right. Because <laughs> he made it, he, he set the ground rules. Hallelujah. And so now we have this. <coughs> Jesus, is, <coughs> Jesus has come. Jesus came and rid us of the, of the authority of the curse, the power of the curse, delivered us from the curse. And now by having faith in him, we become heirs of of the promise that God made to Abraham and his seed. Now, let me say this. It's available to the Jew and the Gentile. It, there's no exclusivity here. Okay? Now, God did make a natural covenant with the Jews, and he honors that. <clears throat> and he'll honor that in the end by grafting them back in. When the veil is off of their eyes and they receive, they see Jesus as Messiah. Okay? They'll accept that and be grafted in. Hallelujah. Okay? And so, because, you know, God, what was it? When they get ready to deliver the children of Israel, God remembered his covenant. They made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, their cry had come up. He, he remembered the covenant. All right? All right. So, the law was, we were delivered from the curse of the law. Jesus took the curse. Now, in that, what, does anybody know what the three, the three curses, overall curse, not just the curse of the law, but the curse of humanity is from the fall of Adam? Sin, sickness, or sickness, poverty, and spiritual death. Man was separated from God. He had to work by the sweat of his brow, and they, were, they became susceptible to disease. Until Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they didn't get sick. They didn't get sick. They had a perfect body. It wasn't until they committed high treason in the garden, they became susceptible. And actually, uh, we've all heard the term born again, haven't we? Ever heard the term born again? Yeah. Where are we born again from? Well, like Nicodemus asked Jesus, can I, call, can I go into my mother's womb the second time and be born? And you got to think, oh, my God. 
And we were here about a 13-pound baby the other day, and you're thinking, whoo! How about a 250-pound one? I'm not a woman. I don't even want to think about that. And Jesus, you know, Jesus corrected him and said, you know, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, what he just really made this clear was there's a physical birth and there's a spiritual rebirth. Your spirit gets born again. Your body will get redeemed as incorruptible when, when Christ comes. Okay? So we use the term born again. We've been born what? From spiritual death. And as we've said before many times in the past, death does not mean to cease to exist. It means separation. Physical death is the separation of the human spirit from the physical body. You don't cease to exist when your body dies. Your body will go back to the ground, but your spirit will go, if you're born again, heaven. If you're not, hell. There's no little purgatory place floating around out here. You ain't going to go hang out. You know, there's not levels down in hell where, you know, you can serve down here for this when they go to a, a, you know, from a maximum security to a minimum security prison. Hell is a maximum security prison for unsaved, disembodied spirits. But it means separation. Spiritual death is so is a separation of the physical body from the human spirit. Um, eternal death, or the second death, eternal death is, a, is the, um, gosh, I just lost it. The second death is the eternal separation of the human spirit from God. You will never be in the presence of God again. Okay? Physical death, spiritual death. Yeah, spirit, you know, so the you know, so physical death, separation of the spirit from the body. Spiritual death, okay, is the separation of man, God's spirit from man's spirit from God. Eternal death is the eternal separation of that spirit from God. Okay? So death does not mean cease to exist. You will exist from now and ever in one of two places. In the rest and peace of being saved, or in the torment and damnation of hell. Or the, actually the lake of fire. You get drawn up and get put in the lake of fire. That's, that's the biggie. I mean, but once you're in the holding tank, that's, just, that's it. Hell's the holding tank. You know, you'll be eternally separated from God's presence. Okay? And so the, the curse, when Satan came in and, and deceived man, the curse came in because of the fall of man. He became spiritual dead. He, took, he was the first man to be born again. He was born from life unto death. Satan became his father. Well, we're all God's children. Well, John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. Don't think that means we're all God's children. Just say it. And don't walk that way. When man sinned, he died spiritually. He didn't cease to exist. He was separated from God because God is life. Amen. And when he was separated from God, he died spiritually. And he began, and, and that's when they found out they was butt naked. Why? God is what? Your, think about it. First John, God is love. God is life. And God is light. We saw a little bit of that of Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. When they woke up and he was glowing, and he wasn't a force ghost like in Star Wars. Okay? But he was glowing in so much that his raiment changed to glistening white. What was that? That was a hint. Of Adam and Eve in the garden. He didn't let it all out. They, wouldn't take, they couldn't handle it. In the garden, <coughs> when God created Adam and Eve, they didn't put clothes on them because the light around them, from the light in them, covered them. They were covered in light. Your nudist colonies are not like the Garden of Eden. And dear God, I don't even want to see in there, but cover up. You old wrinkled up prune. And they love to go down to Florida. They got a beach near Cape Canaveral down there. They, they go out there and lay out naked. 
It's a national park, national seashore. And the, national, the federal government says they could go out there naked. Who wrote that one? I mean, take your family down there and look at that nasty mess. Hello? Just say it. But when they died, when they sinned, they were born again from life to death. And the Bible talks about Satan in the kingdom. It's called the kingdom of darkness. The light went out. Because their spirits were separated from light, from God. And when the light went out, so did the covering. And they knew they were naked. And so they are, there they are, separated from God. And they're under a curse now. They're going to work by the sweat of their brow. Hello? God makes the promises in Genesis 3.15 3, of the coming Redeemer. Hallelujah. Thank God he did. And I'm so far from getting anywhere near my notes where I thought I was going tonight. Whew. But are y'all enjoying it? That's what I want to know. Get anything out of it? That's what I, that's all I need to know. If it takes us six months, we'll do it. It won't be like the, the, the life and teachings of Paul. I started a series a number of years ago called The Life and Teachings of Paul. I thought it was going to be about a six-week series. Over two years later, we finished. It was all on Wednesday nights, but over two years later, and we covered some ground. Anybody remember that series? <laughs> that was good. Huh? Still on YouTube. Still out there. Okay. Now, when you got born again, your spirit became light again. The problem is your body is, is, is corruptible. So it doesn't manifest the glory physically like it did in the garden before the body became corruptible. This is a corruptible mortal body. Okay? So you've got to, don't, don't go out there and start a, a born again nudist camp. We just letting the glory shine through. That, that, that ain't glory, baby. Okay. But although we have been redeemed from those things, <coughs> Satan will consistently and constantly try to get us to accept and walk in the curse. So this is why we have to understand the Abrahamic covenant. Because we have the right so, uh, not to live there. When, when Satan offers a curse, sickness, lack, poverty, spiritual death, we can resist it. Submit yourself, therefore, to God, Paul says. Resist the devil. He will flee. Paul didn't say that. Who said that, Brother Bill? James or uh, Peter? James, yeah. Um, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Literally, the Greek, he will flee from you as in terror. He don't want you to find out who you are in Christ. He doesn't want you to know that you got the blessing. He doesn't want you to know that you're in covenant with God. He wants you to believe that he is the Wizard of Oz and you, you're no match for him. Remember this from the book of Revelation. When we see Satan about to be cast into the pit, that, that we will say, is this he who calls the nations to tremble? We're going to be amazed at how we let that little demon wimp frustrate us and hold us down and keep us out of the blessings of God. That's why we teach. That's why we preach the Word. Because if you get the revelation of who you are in Christ and what the promise is to you and how to live by faith and how to implement it and execute it in your life, you overcome Him. Hallelujah. Because you're under the blood. And he's giving you a word of your testimony, the word of God. Amen. Um, Christ is Abraham's seed, and because of that, we are Abraham's seed. God cut a covenant with Abraham, which promised that his seed would be blessed. And again, if you don't understand the Abrahamic covenant, you will not know what you have a right to. And we have been blessed, so we can be a blessing. Now, the curse can affect your ability to be what God wants you to be. If you don't take authority over it and stop it from being implemented in your life. So a lack of faith 
in the blessing keeps a person on the sidelines of the promises of God. That's not, we're not done. We'll pick up next week. No, we won't. I'm, my, our anniversary is next Wednesday. We're not going to be here. We're going to go celebrate our anniversary. Okay? Anybody got a problem with that? I mean, if you do, I'm sorry. We're still going. All right? 42 years next Wednesday. Okay? Although we got married on a Sunday, you know. Um, July 19th, 1981 was a Sunday. Did y'all know that? I know that because we got married on a Sunday, and that's the date. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going to go celebrate our, our anniversary next Wednesday. We're going out of town for a couple of days. All right. We're going to have dinner at a nice restaurant. We're going to ride around the mountains. Hello. And Brother Bill, doctor and doctor. How many doctors do you have? Two, doctor and Dr. Bill. I often refer to him as Doctorus Maximus or Maximus Doctorus. One of them was not a good person in real history, so I tried to change it to the different one. <laughs> okay. But we're changing history. All right. All right, let's take up the offering and go home. Um, trust everybody got, got good things out of that. Hallelujah. Now, listen, y'all start pulling and I'll start teaching more. <laughs> I mean, I, I could go right on till midnight. You get in some flows sometimes, you don't want to quit. Right. You know, offering envelope for the in house on seat backs in front of you. If you're giving electronically, uh, Cash App, Dollar Sign, Expedition Triad, PayPal, give at expeditiontriad.org. Hallelujah. And um, praise the Lord. All right. Those online, you can go ahead and send your electric offerings. Praise God. Hallelujah. We like it when you show up. Okay, we really like to see you in person. Uh, hallelujah. Um, I tell you one of the good things about electronic giving. Now, it used to be we had snow in the winter, and we missed a Sunday. I don't know what it was. People didn't, they didn't make it up. We're like, but we got a bill to pay. <laughs> we got bills to pay, you know. And, and you can't come out and scold the people. You bunch of dog non non givers. We don't do that, you know. It, it honestly is, um, I believe, we believe the Word of God teaches tithing and giving, but it is a heart relationship with you and God. I don't ever want people to give uh, out of necessity. They need to give because they want to. Tithe because they love God. Give extra because they love God. Not because, hello, we're coming to your house and checking your tax returns. Churches, there are churches and, and fake denominations that actually do that. They, they get their tax returns for the year and see if they tithe. Because one, one of those groups that when you die, if you get everything right by the church, that fake church, you get to go to heaven and have your own planet and populate it with babies yourself. Have perpetual sex and populate it. So they're doing everything they can to make sure they stay good. <laughs> ain't popping nothing, ain't nothing even in hell. All righty. Father, we bless the people as they give, as they tithe. Thank you that heaven's windows are open unto them, and you pour out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for those giving electronically. Lord bless you. Uh, if you're watching online, we... Go ahead, Brother Joe. Go ahead. Um, if you're watching online, we thank you for being with us, and we just declare unto you that, uh, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So... Come join us again here at Extradition Church of the Triad, where we're living a life of victory forged by faith. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the